Uh, my name is Paul Linden and I'm going to chair this uh, uh, talk uh, by John Bush. It's a great pleasure to have John as our speaker today. I'm sure many of you uh, know of him and his work. John uh, did his undergraduate and master's degree at the University of Toronto uh, and then his PhD uh, at Harvard on uh, compositional convection in the Earth's core. And then he spent uh, four glorious years as a postdoc in Dant, um, uh, which we enjoyed very much having him with us in the lab. And he does wonderful experiments and interesting analysis and has written uh, a whole range of wonderful papers. Um, and uh, i just read out a couple of titles because I think they're actually very interesting. Uh, he has published extensively in Nature and has two annual review papers um, and of course in JFM, Science and Physics Today uh, and his titles are things like uh, Walking on Water, uh, Meniscus Climbing Insects and the one I like best of all which is Natural Drinking Strategies which I think was just going down the pub after the seminar on a Friday afternoon but apparently has more to it than that. Okay, so without further ado, I'll ask uh, John to start. He's going to talk about pilot wave hydrodynamics, hydrodynamic quantum analogs, and hydrodynamic quantum field theory. So, John. Again, thanks for the invitation. I feel like I'm playing a home game whenever I'm at the damped uh, four o'clock fluid seminar, which is the sort of holy grail. So, um, it's nice to have a home team when I'm uh, speaking on the subject. I'd like to... Um, Begin with my acknowledgements. I usually leave this to the end when I run out of room, but I want to thank all of the many people, so colleagues, grad students, postdocs. I've been working on this problem now for 10 years, so many of the of my former students are now moved on to postdocs and faculty positions of their own, so this is a little bit of a fossil in time. But I also like to thank above all and dedicate this uh, talk to the memory of Yves Couder, who is a wonderful man and uh, a brilliant scientist. Okay, so we're going to start with a little discussion of quantum mechanics. So this is a theory that uh, describes the statistics of microscopic particles. They don't describe the trajectories, oh, and uh, some will go so far as to flatly deny that they exist. And so this is the quantum description of the free particle. E equals h bar omega, p equals h bar k, where h bar is Planck's constant. So it's basically associating a particle with an energy and therefore a frequency. and um, you have this notion that um, this, this particle is somehow associated with, uh, given its energy, it has a kinetic energy and so forth, and so it has a momentum, and associated with that momentum is a wave number k. So where does this come from? Where is the particle? And these are the sorts of questions you get in trouble for asking as an undergraduate, or at least I did. Um, where is the particle? Why does it move? And so today we're going to see how one can actually understand this from a hydrodynamic perspective. So. Um, I should also add that this insistence on the completeness of a trajectory-free quantum mechanics has led to long-standing uh, difficulties, in particular the quantum paradoxes and um, <clears throat> an abundance of troubling language. So I just have here a grocery list thereof. Um, we have a uh, wave particle. Let me just see if I can move this out of the way. So we have wave particle duality, quantum uncertainty, complementarity, spin, superposition, non-locality, um, wave function collapse, non-local quantum potential, single particle diffraction and interference, and quantum entanglement. And again, I'll present here a perspective which allows you to try at least to make sense of these um, expressions. Okay, so <clears throat> um, such is the sort of prevailing um, confusion in quantum mechanics in terms of the fundamentals that uh, even its most distinguished practitioners um, seem to glory in the inscrutability of their own subjects. So we're here going to take a, an old-fashioned Newtonian uh, perspective. Um, <clears throat> and this is one that has been taken uh, by all people who have uh, pursued these so-called hidden variables. So they sound spooky, but they're, it's simply an attempt to write down a trajectory equation in quantum mechanics, okay? And these have all, it turns out, involved uh, a particle interacting with a wave, okay? So in terms of history, De Bray in the 1920s proposed the double wave solution. Um, he imagined a particle moving in resonance with a, a guiding wave and then carving out a 
a uh, statistical behavior, which is somehow analogous to that uh, standard, standard uh, quantum mechanics. Bohm uh, presented a single wave, a pilot wave theory, and we'll describe that a little bit later. Um, Nelson, there's also stochastic dynamics where you imagine that uh, quantum mechanics can be rationalized in terms of a diffusive process with the diffusivity, which is given by basically the mean particle velocity times its wavelength. So you can think of it as a kind of a, that's the, the De Broglie wavelength again here. This is, uh, so it's basically a, a um, random walk. And uh, this uh, stochastic dynamics has been, I'd say the most developed pilot wave theory is that of uh, De La Pena and Cheto, who uh, have this stochastic electrodynamics and they seek the pilot wave in the electromagnetic quantum vacuum. So um, what this, so in 2005, Yves Couder and Emmanuel Four discovered this hydrodynamic pilot wave system in which a particle moves uh, in response to resonance with the guiding wave. So it's really a, it was a, the first macroscopic realization of the sort of mechanics imagined by De Bray in the 1920s. And lo and behold, it exhibits several features of quantum systems that were thought to be exclusive to the microscopic realm. So the questions raised are what are the key dynamical features responsible for the quantum-like behavior? What are the, potential, what are the potential limitations of the system as a quantum analog? And can it guide us towards a rational theory for quantum dynamics, that is to say, a sensible trajectory equation? Okay, okay so the outline, I, I apologize for the long title. Um, you can see I truncated it in my own slide, but it, there's basically a four, it's a story uh, play with four parts. We start off with the uh, hydrodynamic quantum analogs, which is looking in the lab to see what this uh, system can and can't do in terms of capturing quantum-like features. Then we have pilot wave hydrodynamics, which involves the theoretical modeling of the walking droplet system. But then we relax um, our, the sort of constraints imposed on this pilot wave theory by the laboratory, by the hydrodynamic system, and start exploring a more general pilot wave theory with which we can hope to uh, connect to existing quantum pilot wave theories. And this indeed leads us to the final chapter of the story, which is the hydrodynamic quantum field theory, which is really an extension of de Broglie's mechanics informed by the hydrodynamic system. Okay, so the hydrodynamic system involves a vibrating bath, so the classic Faraday problem. You have a bath of fluid vibrating at around 50 hertz um, and has amplitude A, so the vibrational acceleration uh, given here um, is the control parameter. And when that, when that crosses a critical threshold, um, the uh, waves are excited. So all of the experiments done with these walking drops are done below the Faraday threshold. So in the absence of the drop, there would be no waves. Okay. So um, now this, it's been known since 1978 in Drill Walker's Flying uh, Circuits of Physics. He describes levitating drops on a vibrating bath. So this is possible simply by virtue of the sustenance of the air layer between the drop and bath uh, during impact. So you can have, so this is basically a millimeter uh, in diameter uh, bouncing on uh, the bath at around 50 hertz, okay? And what Couder uh, discovered is that these drops uh, in a certain regime become unstable and start moving. Um, they become unstable on their wave field and become, and are propelled here we see from left to right um, because it's a landing on the slope of its wave field. Okay, and the key thing in the system is the resonance. So because it's resonant, the basically in order to get these walkers, it has to be bouncing at the Faraday uh, frequency, which is the most unstable uh, uh, frequency of the Faraday waves. Okay, and I should mention that these are these waves, the, the Faraday waves are subharmonic. Okay, so um, the drop is then it achieves resonance with, with its wave field and is then propelled along it by its wave, and you see it's basically dressed in this quasi-monochromatic waveform. And a key feature of the system is that it's non-Markovian or hereditary. And what I mean by that is that in order to describe the dynamics of the particle, uh, you need to integrate backwards in time. So this is because the waveform that it lands on, which uh, imparts the force to it, uh, depends on its history because it's laying down waves all along its uh, path. Okay? And so, and in fact, all of the quantum-like features, as we'll see, emerge in this limit of high memory, so when these waves are very persistent, and this happens as you approach the Faraday threshold. Okay, so we can write down a trajectory equation for these resonant walkers. Um, so we have the inertial term, the drag term, and you have a force which is proportional to the slope of the wave, and this is of course the interesting term. In order to calculate this, you need to know the local fluid depth, and so 
you have to calculate the wave field generated by its pass, uh, along its path, okay? And so you see now when I, I mentioned memory, I didn't define it. Here we define memory. So memory, this memory parameter is the ratio of the time scale of decay, viscous decay of the waves in the absence of vibrational forcing. This is the Faraday period, and this is the driving acceleration gamma here. And so as, you, as gamma approaches gamma F, as you approach the Faraday threshold, uh, the memory becomes uh, very large and uh, the waves are very persistent. And that's when the quantum-like features are. <coughs> so although the system is, as a whole, of course, local, the dynamics of the drop is non-local in time because in order to get the instantaneous force acting on it, you have to integrate over its history. Okay, now you can strobe this uh, system and um, <coughs> grab one frame per bounce and you can see the particle gliding along its pilot wave. Okay, so you can see that this drop appears to surf on the interface drift, dressed by this quasi-monochromatic wave field. Okay. Okay, and we can, we've developed, a, by, by averaging our trajectory equation, we can, we have the so-called stroboscopic model, which describes the dynamics in the strobed frame. So here you assume, you're basically making the assumption that instead of discrete impacts, the drop is continuously releasing waves as it moves along its path, okay? Um, and this, uh, because we now have a form instead of, which involves instead of an infinite sum, um, an integral, you can um, uh, do some analysis. In particular, you can um, uh, examine the stability of the walking state and various dynamical states, orbital states, which we've done. In fact, we've sort of pushed the theory. What did I do? Um, well, I'm, I accidentally drew something. Um, so you can get these bound states. Um, uh, so the drop, the distance between the drops is quantized by the wave field. It's basically going to be some uh, fraction of the Faraday wavelength. And these will then um, go unstable above a critical forcing threshold. But the, you get quantization imparted on the system by the wave field. Um, you can also have dynamic bound states. So here we have an orbiting pair. Here we have a promenading pair walking side by side. And in looking at these more complex systems, we sort of uh, successively refined the theoretical models used to describe them. And here we've looked at some rings of bouncing drops. So this is work done by um, Miles Couchman and Stuart Thompson looked at the top, top right, the motion in an annulus, and you can see you get a very, uh, you get uh, all sorts of subtle instabilities, which we uh, rationalize theoretically. Again, all of the, all with the view to, to um, refining our theoretical models. Okay, so let's get on with the hydrodynamic quantum analog. So this started in 2005 with a very exciting paper uh, by uh, Kuder and Four, where they looked at a uh, single particle diffraction. Okay, and this is of course one of the holy grails in quantum mechanics, um, um, as you can see from Feynman's quote here, and what they found, so they basically send a walking droplet towards the, uh, a slit, which is composed of, uh, so it's basically a gap between two submerged walls, and the, the drop comes in at some impact um, parameter yi and exits at some angle alpha, and so this is the number density of alpha, um, and you can see it has this three-peaked form, right? And so <clears throat> you can see here how a sort of coherent uh, wave-like statistical, um, uh, wave-like statistics emerged from chaotic pilot wave dynamics. Now these results were contested by Bohr and co-workers in a s couple of papers and revisited by us in a JFM paper. So, um, so what we found is that there are two different regimes in one, the behavior is entirely predictable. That is to say, if you give me the impact parameter, I can tell you what the outgoing uh, angle is. And that's true in the bulk of the parameter regime, but at very high memory, things become unpredictable. So you see here, uh, this sort of scatter plot, which shows the uh, degree of uh, the deflection angle as a function of the impact parameter. Uh, but nevertheless, you always get this sort of, these sort of three peaks. And this is the, the dominant structure in the experiments of Kuder and Four, but you don't get the Fraunhofer diffraction pattern. But so what, right? Um, why would you expect to get exactly the same diffraction pattern? There are many reasons why you shouldn't, um, and I'll go over those in a second. But also, I think the important thing, which is the most mysterious feature of quantum, uh, the double slit experiment in quantum mechanics, is that whether or not the other slit is open uh, alters the behavior coming through slit number one. Okay, so here we see. Uh, identical initial conditions uh, approaching, this is a single slit and a double slit. So this is 
for this approaching the leftmost slit. So you can imagine opening or closing this. And the fact that it's open does alter the trajectories of the particles through the first slit. Okay, and so you see that the second slit does have an influence, and this is by virtue of the fact that the, the uh, drop uh, is dressed by a wave. So this walker, which is the compound object of drop plus wave, has some finite spatial extent. And this is precisely what was proposed by De Bruy in the 1920s, okay? So again, the fact, so it captures, if you will, this sort of non-local uh, feature, which is responsible for a single particle interference, as they call it, in quantum mechanics. But the details of the diffraction pattern are not the same. Again, that doesn't surprise me. So even if you, uh, as we'll see in this um, analogy as we develop it, the uh, Faraday wavelength plays the role of the de Broglie wavelength in de Broglie's mechanics. And in uh, electron diffraction, the slit is a thousand de Broglie wavelengths wide, whereas here we're looking at one or there's one or two uh, Faraday waves uh, is, the, is the gap width. Um, and also, you, there's little reason to believe that the boundary conditions, or indeed the pilot waveforms, are at all similar in quantum mechanics. Okay, but nevertheless, you do have diffraction because the particle has associated with it a wave, and you do have these non-local features by virtue of the fact that the drop is dressed by a wave. And we'll see, in fact, at the end, when we come to this hydrodynamic quantum field theory, we'll see that the uh, waveform that one expects in quantum mechanics, the pilot waveform, is markedly different from that arising in the walker. So to sort of hope that we can revisit and get something which is more Fraunhofer-like in the future. Okay, okay so uh, walkers in a rotating frame. This is a, an experiment, these were experiments um, here done with, by uh, Emmanuel Four and Couder's group. And so they looked at the motion of a walker in a rotating frame and they found that, and what do you expect if you have something moving at uniform speed V in a rotating frame? Um, all of you geophysical fluid dynamicists out there, will be comfortable with this one. So you have a balance between the centripetal outwards force and the Coriolis inwards force, okay? And so you expect an inertial orbit, which de whose uh, uh, radius decreases with uh, rotation rate omega. And so this is what happens at low memory. So the thing basically just moves around on a, on a loop. But at high memory, when the waves become persistent, you can see here the particle starts interacting with its own wake. Um, and as a result, there's a quantization imposed on the orbital radius. So you can see here, and the classical result is just the monochromatic, sorry, monotonic decrease of uh, radius with rotation rate. Here you see that in their data to these preferred bands. So basically, there's a quantization, and the quantization length is the Faraday wavelength. Okay? Basically, the drop is confined to move in the troughs of its, of its uh, wave field. So it's basically moving on its own potential. And so owing to the analogous form of the uh, Lorentz force acting on a charge Q in a uniform magnetic field and the Coriolis force acting on a mass M in a rotating frame, uh, they drew the analogy with, uh, between these uh, quantized inertial orbits and Larmor levels. And again, the quantization uh, length in our system is the Faraday wavelength, uh, whereas in, the, the, in uh, quantum mechanics, it's the De Broglie wavelength. Okay. So with our uh, trajectory equation, we were able to analyze the system. So we just take our trajectory equation, the stroboscopic model, and add the Coriolis force. So we can then seek orbital solutions, so uniform uh, angular speed and radius, and solve. So we get a solution curve for each memory. And it has, and we can assess its stability. So that our solution curve, now this is again r versus omega, um, uh, develops unstable branches indicated in red. And as you go to higher memory, this, the solution becomes more and more unstable. So you have not only these un, uh, uns, purely unstable red curves, you have these green curves, which are unstable with a, with a wobble. So the eigenvalue has a, has a uh, imaginary component. So the thing basically wobbles as it flies off to infinity. Turns out that in the lab, some nonlinear effects stabilize these wobbling solutions. But nevertheless, as you go to higher and higher memory, these periodic circular periodic orbits become progressively more unstable until finally um, you get to a situation where it's chaotic and the drop switches between these unstable orbits. Okay, so if we look here, this is relatively low memory of a single stable circular orbit. At higher memory, it flicks between, it basically jumps intermittently between these weakly unstable circular orbits. So if you plot the radius of curvature as a function of time, you see these plateaus 
which correspond to uh, these individual quantized orbits. And, and as a result, the emergent statistics has a multimodal form with peaks corresponding to the unstable circular orbits. Okay, so again, this is a second example where you see coherent wave-like statistics emerging from chaotic pilot wave dynamics. Okay, and the other interesting th thing that came out of that study is, uh, is that the solution curve actually, at very high memory, touches down on the vertical axis. So this vertical axis is omega equals zero. So it's suggesting that the possibility exists of a drop zipping around in its own wave field, even in the absence of rotation. Okay, and this um, <clears throat> uh, then evokes the notion of hydrodynamic spin states, and we'll see that uh, this then is going to correspond to the classical model of the electron if we now, if we consider that the Faraday wavelength is now not the de Broglie wavelength, but the Compton wavelength. And we'll see how that comes to pass when we look at this hydrodynamic quantum field theory. Okay, and, and the other thing to note, so we have this, this solution curve touching down. Of course, they're all unstable in the lab, but you can imagine a parameter regime uh, so, um, um, where that might not be the case, where they might be stable. But in any case, if you look at one of these uh, points where it touches down, um, as you apply now weak rotation, you get a splitting of these states, which is uh, analogous to Zeeman splitting in, um, in quantum mechanics. Okay, and so uh, another study of, a uh, very exciting study of um, orbital polyboid dynamics, in my view, was done in Couder's group. So Stefan Parar and Mathieu Labousse uh, joined uh, Couder and Four et al. And they looked at the uh, motion of, uh, they managed to embed ferrofluid inside the, the bouncing drop and apply a uh, central spring force, so a simple harmonic potential. So the particle wants to, they, whenever they're walking, they want to move at uniform speed, but the thing is being constrained by the spring force, so it basically orbits around the center in some fashion. And you can see the different periodic states uh, accessible in the lab. And you can see that these are actually, there's a double quantization. So they're quantized both in mean radius, which is a proxy for energy, and uh, angular momentum. So here we have the circles. Um, as you uh, move along this axis, you get, so here we have zero angular momentum. These are the Lemniscates, gates. And then you have the, these uh, more complex structures, the trefoils and quadrifoils as you go upwards. And again, as this, when the system becomes chaotic, it switches intermittently between weakly unstable periodic states, the result being these uh, multimodal quantum-like statistics. Okay, and so, um, our first experimental venture into this uh, problem was uh, conducted by Dan Harris. Um, and these are very extremely difficult experiments. And I was very excited by these because when I was an undergraduate in quantum mechanics, uh, well, of course, when I got interested in this problem, all I could remember of my quantum mechanics was particle in a box. So I sort of went back and I discovered that since studying that, they've actually done these experiments. And it's nice to be able to actually compare our experiments to their experiments. And so I said, oh, I wonder if this would work. So these are experiments done, um, oops, um, in quantum mechanics. So note the scale. So this, this is the quantum corral 75 angstroms. We're going to do a physical analog of this, which is on the scale of 10 centimeters. Um, and there are, ele there are electrons zipping around on the surface of metal. And these are the, the, these are the, fen the fence on the corral is composed of positive ions, which basically repel the electrons and contain them. And the waves here you see are the, uh, the probability density. So it's basically um, the likelihood of finding an electron at any given point. And it looks like the modes of the cavity. So, and these have the de Broglie wavelength, okay? And so can we do this with the hydrodynamic system if we increase our scale from angstroms to centimeters? So here's our uh, bouncing drop. So this is a video of the drop trajectory and it's color coded according to drop speed. So these are again, Dan's experiments. Um, and you can see a couple of things. Notice that its speed seems to be modulating a little bit. There are variations in speed, which seem to actually correspond to the Faraday wavelength. But you think we're never gonna get anything here. This is too much of a mess. It's a, com it's a <clears throat> complete hodgepodge, it's chaotic. But nevertheless, in the fullness of time, there's a correlation between position and speed and as a result, you get this emergent um, statistical waveform, which looks like the mode of the cavity. Okay, so again, you see how chaotic pilot wave dynamics can give rise to sort of coherent statistical behavior, which looks very much like that in quantum mechanics. Okay, and the emerging physical picture, you have three time scales. You have the time scale of wave generation, which is a bouncing time scale. Then you have this intermediate translation time, 
Then you have the time scale of uh, statistical convergence. So the amount of time it takes to get to this uh, pattern you see bottom right. And what's remarkable, again, given the difference in scales between this system and the quantum system, we are actually able to get all three of these time scales in the lab. So the time scale for statistical convergence is around uh, an hour. So of course it could have been a month, it could have been a, a decade and we never would have seen it. But uh, we can actually see all three of these time scales in the lab. This is of course a, the bouncing time scale is a fraction of a second. This is sort of seconds and here we have about an hour. So I was very excited by those and I was, they were, the experiments seemed to be so difficult and Dan is such a good experimentalist I thought no one would, able be, would ever, ever be able to reproduce them. But uh, uh, fortunately I had a, 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 um, a, an instructor in our department, Pedro Sainz, who is an equally uh, capable experimentalist and he looked at um, the cur these elliptical corrals and he found a similar signature. You find that the, uh, there's a, a correlation between position and speed which gives rise to a robust statistical um, uh, signature. Okay, and he found that you can actually, via topography, you can uh, um, uh, apply these sort of statistical projection effects analogous to the quantum mirage. But what I want to point out is in that same study, we looked at the wave field. Okay, so the instantaneous wave field at any given time is different from um, the PDF, okay, from the histogram. Um, but the average wave field is not. So if you just time average this instantaneous wave field, you see that it takes precisely the same form as the particle histogram. And again, the, why is the mean pilot wave an interesting feature? Because on average, the particle is exploring, we have this notion of the particle exploring, creating its own potential. So what is that potential? Well, in an average sense, it's, it's, it's this, right? And that, of course, then defines the particle, uh, the statistical behavior, okay? And you can actually show that this, this um, uh, average wave and histogram can be expressed as basically two modes of the cavity and Pedro showed that you can uh, tune those using uh, bottom topography. But um, this notion of the mean pilot wave field, so you can actually prove uh, as did Matt Dury that the um, mean pilot wave can be expressed as a, as a convolution of the bouncer wave field. So that's the wave field you get if the drop just bounces in place indefinitely. And that will of course, its amplitude increases with memory if you convolve that with its histogram, okay, then that defines the average wave field. But notice that this is a, it's a funny thing, this average wave field, right? It's a wave field whose form depends on the statistics of the drop, okay? So you're having a particle whose dynamics is being affected by its statistics, okay? And we'll see that this harkens back to some notions in quantum mechanics, in particular in Bohmian mechanics. Okay? Okay, and another uh, key observation here is that um, <clears throat> this in 1D, in very, in very high memory limit, so here we have a drop just oscillating, uh, walker just oscillating back and forth, and at relatively low memory, the, uh, you see the wave field following it, it's sloshing around, but as you go to a very high memory, the instantaneous wave field converges to the mean, which means now this particle is navigating this non-local potential, this mean pilot wave potential, whose form depends on the statistics of the particle, okay? And this is a sort of notion which I think we need to connect to quantum mechanics. And in our system, it's most prevalent, as we see here in 1D, it's less prevalent in 2D. Um, and this is simply because of viscous damping. So basically viscous damping is our enemy as we try to move towards quantum, try to achieve quantum analogs. Okay, but nevertheless, in this particular case, we see the particle moving in its non-local mean pilot wave potential. Okay, and so another uh, experiment which uh, Dan did, Dan Harris was a particle approaching a submerged pillar. So we're just interested in scattering. We're going, oh, I wonder what happens when th these things scatter. And as with everything in this problem, you, you go looking for something and you find something more interesting. And we just thought it would be deflected in some fashion, but it turns out it locks on. So that's what happens at low memory, but at high memory, it locks onto a spiral and it's not just any spiral, it's a logarithmic spiral, okay? And again, the only reason, so again, it would just walk in a straight line if it weren't for this uh, pillar. So we can ask the question, what is the effective force that need to be applied by this pillar to give rise to this logarithmic spiral, okay? And if you do that, it's a lift force. Um, so again, this is how you, the sort of conceit you have to say, okay, 
um, let's imagine we, we don't know that there's a wave field there. What would be the effective force that would give rise to the same trajectory? So you can infer this, and it's a lift force proportional to the, uh, the cross product of the walker velocity and its instantaneous angular velocity around the pillar. And again, using this analogy between the Coriolis and Lorentz force, it looks like particle, uh, it looks like it's sort of reminiscent of self-induction, right? Because it's a it's like a charge feeling the magnetic field associated with its own current. So it's very strange, and I think there's probably something deep there that I'm missing. But um, in any case, you see that if you don't take into account the fact that it's a pilot wave system, you infer this non-local force, right? You're infer basically inferring action at a distance. OK, so another uh, scattering problem. So this is, again, uh, Pedro Sainz leading the charge on this one. So these are Friedel oscillations, which arise in quantum mechanics in the same sort of system as the um, quantum corral. You have electro a sea of electrons on a metal surface. And you see these waves, these little, these are basically impurities here, which can uh, be a, a little uh, charged particle or what have you. But anyways, the, the electrons scatter off it, and you see the waves in the surrounding uh, electron C. And so there's no mechanism for this. Of course, there's no notion of trajectory in quantum mechanics, so they solve uh, Schrodinger's equation with uh, an appropriate scattering potential, okay? Um, and again, the scale here is angstroms, and we're now going to uh, centimeters. So we have a well, which is a, but a centimeter across. We see a walker approaching it. So basically, we consider the well as a region of uh, high excitability. <clears throat> and the walker is drawn in along a spiral and exits along its center line. And as it exits, there are actually speed uh, modulations. So it's basically interacting with the wave field of the, um, of the well, with the resonant mode of the well, but it's also it's being perturbed from its steady walking state. And so as it exits, the speed is modulated. And you get these uh, wiggles in speed. And this ultimately gives rise to a, you can see these concentric rings in particle speed. This is around uh, 500 uh, trajectories. And so you see this statistical signature, and it looks very much like that arising in Friedel oscillations. And so we're, while they would say <clears throat> there are no trajectories, we can at least conclude that uh, Friedel oscillations are not inconsistent with the notion of particle trajectories. Okay. Okay, so we've seen, they're basically now, we have two paradigms for macroscopic quantum behavior, and this is why we continue to work on a HQAs in the, in the lab. We try to understand mechanisms, which we hope may play some role when we uh, try and formulate a uh, quantum dynamics. So both of these paradigms that we've seen depend on the resonance between the drop and the wave. So without the resonance, you don't get the quasi-monochromatic wave field, and this is critical for imposing the uh, quantization. Um, and in both of these, they basically involve the drop navigating some non-local potential, which is the wave field which the drop has excited. Okay? And so in orbital pilot wave dynamics, we've seen that the, the uh, quantization comes from the dynamic constraint imposed on the droplet by its quasi-monochromatic wave field. And we've seen when it becomes chaotic, you get this intermittent switching between weakly unstable orbits, um, giving, and this is what's responsible for the quantum-like statistics. And then these inline oscillations, which we've seen in the, just seen in the Friedel crawl, uh, um, analog, these lead to a correlation between position and speed, and so a statistical signature with the guiding wavelength. Okay? This is also, I think, at play in the corrals, and we'll see that it comes up in our quantum model as well. Okay, so now we have not just a grocery list of hydrodynamic quantum analogs, so things that work, some of them work better than others, like we saw in the the uh, single particle diffraction interference, you know, the diffraction pattern's different, uh, but uh, the conceptually, uh, it, it uh, overcomes the major conceptual obstacles. Um, some are better than others. You can imagine some of them work better in a, in a parameter regime that we can't get into in the lab, but that's fine. And it's not, so it's now it's, it's beyond just a shopping list. It's a, it's a COVID style shopping list. So twice as long for those of us who just shop once a month. So, and, and we have now, um, it's also clear what the limitations of the hydrodynamic system is. So we can see again when these things work, when they don't, why they, uh, why they work less well than others. So, and basically viscous damping is our enemy. So, and this is clear from the fact that the quantum features all emerge at the high, um, in the high memory limit. Um, and also there are cases where drop inertia 
is our enemy. So for example, these hydrodynamic spin states, we can, we can hope to get in the low uh, inertia limit, okay? Okay, so now what we wanna do is step, go beyond the hydrodynamic setting, uh, retain the key features of the Walker system, that is to say memory, resonance, and this quasi-monochromatic wave field, but go beyond the parameter regime accessible within the lab. And in doing so, we'll, we'll connect to the C, we'll see to quantum pilot wave theories. Okay, so the simplest generalization is simply a parametric one. So we basically take our trajectory equation and we just non-dimensionalize it and we say, okay, there, there are three terms, so there are two dimensionalist groups. This one prescribes the proximity to Faraday threshold, so basically how strong the waves are. And this uh, kappa naught prescribe is basically the dimensionless inertia. Um, and this, notice that this uh, kappa naught term is bounded in the lab. So it has all the fluid parameters. It can be, it has to lie somewhere between 0.8 and 1.6. Um, of course, you can imagine, and so uh, one strongly constrained in terms of the parameter regime you can explore um, in the lab, but this could be anything in the generalized pilot wave framework. So what, what's, what if it's 10 to the 14? What if it's 10 to the minus 15? What, what features can we get then? So we can ask the question, for what values of these two dimensionless groups does the system look most like quantum mechanics? So when, for example, when can we get hydrodynamic spin states? Uh, when can we get these uh, inline oscillations, which we've seen are the root of uh, quantum statistics in a couple of settings? So that uh, we looked at uh, this the stability of spin states in this generalized pilot wave framework, and we found the parameter regime here where you can uh, stabilize the spin states. Okay, so it's basically in the low inertia limit. Okay. Um, and we looked at the stability of the walking state to these inline oscillations. And again, you have some finite regime accessible in the lab. And in the lab, mostly you'll get overdamped or underdamped response to a perturbation in, in the walking speed. But in this generalized framework, you can also, you get a much richer dynamic. So you can get an unstable regime. And in this unstable regime, you can get this uh, so-called jitter where the particle moves and then stops, builds up its pilot wave, then moves. And you can actually, in the, so this is a periodic jittering state here. You can also get a aperiodic jittering state, which looks like a, a random walk. It actually behaves as does um, with a sort of diffusivity, which is analogous to that arising in uh, Nelson's uh, stochastic dynamics. So it's, again, depends on the mean particle speed and the wavelength of the, of the guiding wave. Okay. Okay, so that's the simplest uh, generalization. So it's a parametric generalization. You can also look at alternative waveforms, so different types of spatial temporal damping. Again, one wants to try and minimize the uh, effects of uh, dam uh, vi viscous damping, certainly. Um, you can also imagine going to three dimensions. You can also imagine putting in a stochastic form, uh, stochastic forcing. So then you can have some sort of hybrid between pilot wave dynamics and stochastic dynamics. And uh, we can also try and connect to the quantum pilot wave theories of Bohm and de Bruyne. Okay, so let's start with that. Now, this is something, uh, this is very encouraging. When I saw this, I didn't see this as an undergraduate. I saw this when I started getting interested in the problem. But you start, it's a transformation which allows you to uh, recast linear Schrodinger's equation in hydrodynamic form. So this is called the Madelung transformation. Uh, you ba basically, it's a polar transformation of the wave function. And when you do it, you get something which looks like um, looks like hydrodynamics. So it's good for several reasons. One of which is that uh, you get rid of the i. Secondly, you can find h bar to a single term, and this is the so-called quantum potential. And um, <clears throat> and so this is the the central mystery of quantum mechanics is the origins of this quantum potential. Okay. And so, of course, by doing a polar transformation, you're not introducing any new physics. This just allows you to understand the evolution of the statistics of a quantum system uh, from a hydrodynamic perspective, okay? There is still no trajectory, okay? In order to get a trajectory, what Bohm did is he said, okay, well, let's imagine the particle moves at this quantum velocity of probability, okay? Uh, sorry, yeah, this quantum velocity of probability given here. Um, so if that's the case, then the trajectory equation is this, so the particle moves in response to gradients in the quantum potential and any applied classical potential, okay? So what's funny about this is that this quantum potential is defined entirely in terms of the statistics of the system, okay? So how do you solve problems in 
Bohme mechanics, you solve Schrodinger's equation, you define, you calculate the quantum potential, then you have the particle moving in response to them. But the particle is not, again, it's sort of, there's this, the, this quantum potential is non-local because it's imposed by the statistics of the system, okay? So that's the problem with it. It's uh, non-local and it also, there has other sort of, um, more technical difficulties. For example, if it's a, if you have a statistically steady state, if you have one mode in the corral, it says the particle doesn't move. Okay, so in order to get around these difficulties, they invoked a um, uh, just a couple of years later, they invoked a sorry a um, um, stochastic forcing from the subquantum realm. So this would now be known as the the uh, quantum vacuum. And then you have the particles jostling around this um, this mean motion. So we're basically this this would describe the mean motion. Then you'd have some uh, perturbation associated with some stochastic forcing. Okay. So, but it's interesting to look at this in the context of the walkers um, because if you look at their guidance equation in ours, we have a local uh, pilot wave force. <clears throat> it's simply the slope local slope of the amplitude of the wave field. But if we decompose that uh, local form into a mean and a fluctuating part, then our mean, as we saw before, the mean pilot wave potential is actually non-local, as is the quantum potential. And we, we um, have this perturbation wave field, which when combined with the mean wave field makes things local, they have to invoke both the non-local potential and this uh, stochastic background forcing, right? So we see that we can see the way around the difficulties in quantum in a uh, Bohme mechanics by assuming that they're really describing a mean dynamics, okay? And so, but what's missing for me, the thing that's missing most in Bohme mechanics, its biggest shortcoming is the fact that there's no equation describing how the wave is generated, right? So there is no mechanism for wave generation, whereas ours is, of course, it, we have it from the bouncing drop. Okay? So um, we have, uh, De Bruyne's, so the next step was, so someone who did propose the particle as the source of the wave was that of De Bruyne, so this actually preceded Bohme mechanics. So he, his was an attempt to reconcile quantum mechanics and relativity through considering the wave nature of matter. So this is what Frank Wilczek calls a poem in two lines. This comes from relativity equals mc squared equals h bar omega from quantum mechanics, so it says that every particle of mass m has an associated frequency. This is the Compton frequency. And so de Bruyne said the particle is, has an internal clock. So any particle of mass m has an internal clock at that frequency, and it uh, generate, interacts with the background field and generates a, its pilot wave, okay? Um, and in, so in modern quantum mechanics, this is the, the Compton frequency and the associated Compton length, which is basically the Compton, uh, sorry, the speed of light divided by the Compton frequency. That's the scale at which um, uh, you get the spontaneous production of particle antiparticle pairs. So it's basically the scale at which their theory breaks down. Okay. And, um, uh, and so what we're trying to, what we're imagining here is that all of the dynamics, the bouncing scale is playing the role, the, the Faraday frequency is playing the role of the Compton frequency. And so we can actually try and resolve the dynamics on that scale. And by the way, this scale is, so the Compton frequency for an electron is 10 to 21 hertz. So it's beyond that which is uh, measurable at this time. They're beginning to see vestiges of it in experiments on uh, diffraction of particles and crystals. But anyways, okay, so, so De Bruyne had his double wave solution. The, uh, so it's a double wave because in addition to the standard a psi uh, wave function of quantum mechanics, you have a real physical wave responsible for guiding the particle, which is generated by the particle's oscillation at this zitter frequency, the, the Compton frequency. So it's also known as the zitter bewegung. Okay, so he imagined, he said, okay, the wave has got to satisfy an equation consistent with relativity, which is the Klein-Gordon wave. And then he said, if the particle is monochromatic, then you get P equals H bar K. And in fact, if you look at the origins of P equals H bar K, it's De Bruyne's mechanics. So De Bruyne, so basically this result was taken uh, by Schrodinger to derive Schrodinger's equation. Uh, but then the physical picture which had pr prompted it has been uh, discarded. So uh, another thing that he stressed in his dynamics was this harmony of phase is the fact that the particle always oscillates in resonance with its guiding wave. Okay, but the shortcoming of De Bruyne's mechanics as with Bohm's is he didn't write down an equation, a forced wave equation. So he didn't say how these, this psi wave, this uh, pilot wave is generated by the particle. Okay, but he had this physical picture, which is very similar to that um, 
manifest in the bouncing drop experiment. So you have high, fre high frequency oscillation at the Compton frequency, you have this uh, uh, pilot wave dynamics. If you have a monochromatic wave, then you get P equals H bar K. Then he imagined but never showed that this sort of dynamics would, somewhat, would give rise to the statistics uh, predicted by standard quantum theory. So there is a clear map between uh, de Broglie's mechanics and ours. So our bouncing frequency again plays the role of the zitter. In de Broglie's, we have capillary waves where he has matter waves. Um, I should note that the matter waves actually satisfy, he's proposed that they satisfy Klein-Gordon, as does the Higgs field. Um, and the key parameter in his system, so the basic wave parameter is h-bar, whereas in our system it's surface tension. Um, again, we have the Faraday wavelength in our role in our system playing the role of the de Broglie wavelength, and we have the uh, step size playing the role. So there are two length scales in de Broglie's mechanics. The other is this Compton scale, and the other short uh, length scale in our system is the step length. We'll, we'll clarify a little more what these uh, two wavelengths are in our high dynamic quantum field theory. Okay, so the shortcomings in these quantum pilot wave theories is they nowhere write down an a forced wave equation. So where you have a particle being uh, forcing its pilot wave, okay? So Bowman mechanics we saw is a dynamic reformulation of a statistical theory. So you have the particle basically being piloted by a, a statistical waveform, so it's non-local. Um, de Broglie's mechanics, on the other hand, had the potential to be uh, local, but it was uh, incomplete. So um, he initially distinguished between these two waves, the pilot wave and the statistical wave. But then after Bohmian mechanics, he kind of, he caved a bit and said, oh, the two are linearly proportional, apart from a singularity in the vicinity of the particle in the guiding wave. But basically, when you, if you say the two are the same, then they, uh, theories become the same. And they, this is why they're generally uh, conflated into the so-called de Broglie-Bohm theory. But again, neither writes down an equation which, uh, in which the pilot wave is forced locally by the particle. Okay, so now we, we're developing this uh, high dynamic quantum field theory, which is basically an amalgam of de Broglie's theory and the Walker system. So it's doing what de Broglie would have done initially if he'd had the intuition uh, 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 given, provided by the high dynamic, by the walking drop system, and had he had access to MATLAB. Okay, so uh, this is, this difficulty in uh, these quantum pilot wave theories is pointed out by Holland in his book. He says, we can envisage a more active role for the particle, uh, something which is not even admitted as conceivable in the conventional view, for example, have put a source term into the wave equation. So this is precisely what we do. So we take the, the Klein-Gordon equation, as suggested by de Broglie, but we put in a localized forcing. So we basically force it on the Compton scale, and we force it uh, at twice the Compton frequency. Okay, and we're, so again, we're moving towards the limit uh, suggested by the hydrodynamic case, which is no inertia, no wave damping, okay? So here's our guidance equation that notice there's no inertial term. We just have the particle moving in response to the gradient of the wave, and there's a single free parameter in the system, which is this coupling constant alpha, okay? So what happens is you set the particle, so this is basically exciting the Higgs field locally at the Compton, twice the Compton frequency. It generates a wave field with the, uh, Compton wavelength, uh, and that's, uh, this is just kinematics. We're just saying what the particle does and look at its waveform. Here we uh, start moving the thing and we see the evolution of its wave field and it starts evolving to the stage where uh, P equals H bar K. And so this is, um, uh, this is a sort of an emergent property of the system. And so we get it from the kinematics. So here in the Walker system, the control parameter is the memory. So that changes the pilot waveform in this hydrodynamic quantum field theory. Um, I should mention this is a work done by Yuval Degan very recently. We're quite excited about it. So as we go, the control parameter now is the, uh, uh, the speed of the particle. So it's beta, which is V over C. So as the, as the speed increases, the pilot wave field changes, and you see signatures of both the de Broglie wavelength and the Compton wavelength. Okay. Um, and so that's kinematics. There we're simply prescribing the velocity and looking to see the pilot waveform. But let's look at the dynamics. So it turns out in the dynamics, again, we have one free parameter, which is the forcing, uh, which is this coupling constant. So the, base, the particle bounces in place, but then above a critical alpha, it starts moving. And it starts moving in such a way that P equals H bar K, okay? So, and changing alpha changes the speed. So the coupling constant, as we increase the coupling constant, 
how the particle moves in response to gradients of the wave, the thing goes faster, but it always moves in such a way that P equals H bar K. Okay, so this, if you like, you can just take it as a tenet from God that P equals H bar K, or you can say, well, P equals H bar K is consistent if uh, there's a pilot wave generated by an excitation at twice the Compton frequency, okay? And so not only do you get P equals H bar K out of this theory, you see that there are inline oscillations, okay? So as this thing goes, this, we go, so we're going basically from jitter to zitter. So this is the analog of the inline oscillations, which we saw in our generalized uh, pilot wave framework, but now we're seeing it in this uh, quantum system. Uh, so we have, in addition to the mean motion, such as P equals H bar K, we have these inline oscillations. And if we look at these, they're actually at uh, a frequency, this uh, CK. So you can look at the power spectrum. And so you have a splitting of the uh, frequency. And so this is actually then, <clears throat> you can have a sort of dynamic rationale for the um, uh, quantum relativistic quantum dispersion relation, which is this, so omega squared. So you basically have two oscillations. You have the oscillation associated with the internal vibration at the Compton frequency. Then you have this dynamic oscillation, uh, inline oscillate uh, associated with this zittering motion. Okay. Okay. And so we also see how. Uh, so I've looked at this with uh, Matt Jury following the exciting work by Yuval Degan. So um, he's looked at this problem analytically. So he's found the form of the 1D pilot wave by solving an initial value problem. So he found the critical uh, coupling constant beyond which you get self-propulsion. And he's also extended the model to 2D. So we can now look at the uh, different form of the um, hydrodynamic, uh, sorry, the difference in the form of this hydrodynamic quantum field theory and the, the pilot wave in the Walker system. And they are markedly different. So. Um, in, in the hydrodynamic quantum field theory, you see two signatures. You see these radially propagating waves with the Compton wavelength, and then you see this sort of the plane wave structure with the de Broglie wavelength. Okay, so this is quite different from the horseshoe-like form in the hydrodynamic system. Um, and of course, this is very important if we're going to come back now and look at the double slit with the hydrodynamic quantum field theory. We're going to have a plane wave approaching this the slit, which is very hopeful in terms of getting the Fraunhofer-like diffraction. Okay. Um, and what's beautiful about this theory is it, it clarifies the, the role of the de Broglie wavelength and the Compton wavelength, <clears throat> in, in, even in de Broglie's mechanics. So it turns out there's a signature in this, um, in this pilot wave of both systems. So um, in, for non-relativistic, when V is small relative to C, you get this plane wave with the de Broglie wavelength. So you, so you expect a statistical signature uh, with that wavelength. But as V approaches C, the, the wavelength, the dominant wavelength of the pilot wave is the Compton wavelength, so you can expect to get structure. So for example, these spin states would then correspond to something zipping around the Compton radius at the speed of light, um, at the Compton frequency, I should say. And so this then would correspond to the classical model of the electron. So really, it, it sort of opens up the doors to, in terms of interpreting the the hydrodynamic system, which can, because re really the Faraday wavelength in the in the hydrodynamic system can then play the role of the de Broglie wavelength in non-relativistic quantum mechanics, and the Compton wavelength in relativistic quantum mechanics. Okay, so we have this very uh, nice analogy between pilot wave hydrodynamics and hydrodynamic quantum field theory. The nice thing about hydrodynamic quantum field theory, we've got rid of viscous damping, but we still have certain features of the hydrodynamic case, including this these inline oscillations. So we can say what this uh, uh, the, again, we've been able to go from jitter to zitter. And, um, and so the way forward, we basically want to look at uh, ensemble. So we can, uh, in terms of analytics, we can, uh, we can adopt the stroboscopic approximation, which we developed in the hydrodynamic system. And it turns out it's valid here for in the non-relativistic limit. And so look at the stability of various states. So do what we've done in the hydrodynamic case. Um, and also, one can imagine extending to 3D. Um, and then in terms of numerics, we want to uh, basically couple this, these dynamics to an ensemble interpretation of quantum mechanics. So you look at an, initial, uh, an ensemble of initial conditions and look to see how they evolve. And we, of course, have to che check to see the extent to which they, the evolving statistics satisfy the um, Schrodinger's equation or Klein-Gordon, as the case may be. Okay, and so, and of course, we'll start with things which have a solid grounding in HQA and move forward. I think, again, in, when we revisit the single, the slit diffraction, 
this uh, planar form of the pilot wave field seems rather promising. Okay, and of course we'll, we'll draw from intuition gained from the Walker system. We can add complexity as needed. So there are many degrees of freedom. Uh, so bells and whistles that we can add to this HQFT. Okay, so this has, I hope, provided a sort of um, uh, perspective which allows you, which has the potential of demystifying some of the um, quantum language. So uh, when they talk about wave particle duality, we think of this arising because there's both a particle and a wave. Uh, uncertainty is rooted in the unresolved dynamics on the Compton scale, and it's basically an expression of chaotic dynamics. Um, spin is a manifestation of angular motion on the Compton scale. Um, and superposition, the coexistence of accessible unstable dynamical states. Non-locality, again, we'd say simply is a misinference, and it can be a manifestation of local hereditary dynamics, and you can see this here again. So one of the problems, they have wave function collapse. If this wave function is a complete description of a physical system, then the act of observing and seeing a particle at a given point requires a non-local collapse of the wave function. We can um, see our way around that very easily. We also saw cases in which there is apparent action at a distance, and this mean pilot wave potential playing the role of the quantum potential and Bohmian mechanics. And we can see the way around single particle interference, again, because the particle is dressed by a spatially extended wave. And we can even imagine how entanglement might work. But perhaps I'll leave that discussion of that to a later date. Um, and so to conclude, the, this hydrodynamic system really provides a vehicle for exploring the boundaries between classical and quantum mechanics and extends the range of classical systems. Um, to, to include certain quantum behaviors. And for me, it provides a, most importantly, provides a, a conceptual framework for understanding these features of quantum mechanics. And I hope you convinced that you can see how the local, um, uh, her, not, uh, sorry, local hereditary mechanics can give rise to features which appear to be spatially non-local. Um, and again, it's reminiscent of de Broglie's mechanics, but it's also indicated the shortcomings of both de Broglie's mechanics and Bohm's. And we've, attempted to address these with the development of a hydrodynamic quantum field theory. So my final verdict on this is that quantum mechanics would seem to be at the stage of fluid mechanics prior to the resolution of D'Alembert's paradox. Um, and uh, my feeling is that these quantum paradoxes may be resolved through the elucidation of pilot wave dynamics on the Compton scale. So I'll be happy to take any questions if any hands have shot up and thank all of you for your many contributions. This from my group. In terms of the uncertainty relations, uh, our view is that the uncertainty is rooted in uncertain, so they're basically an expression of an unresolved dynamics on the Compton scale. That would be our interpretation of the quantum uncertainty relations. In our system, there will similarly be uncertainty if we don't resolve the vertical dynamics, okay? And so we've been actually looking at that in the context of tunneling with uh, Tristan Gillet and Loïc Tadrist from uh, Liège. And um, there, um, <clears throat> and so then again, the question is, if you don't resolve this time scale, are you going to be able to predict whether or not you can get tunneling? Okay, and it's certainly, so you have that uncertainty, and this will be amplified if the system is chaotic. You expect, uh, if, you, if you don't resolve that time scale and the system is chaotic, you're going to lose predictive power. Okay, so that's one thing. That's the sort of root of it. And even if you look at the quantum uncertainty relation, the energy time one, it indicates that there is an unresolved dynamics uh, on, the, on the Compton scale. Okay? Mm -hmm. And so the second point I want to mention is, and this is something that Yves Couder and Emmanuel Four pointed out in their in, uh, original paper, if you can find a particle, so when it passes through a slit, its pilot wave is distorted, and so it's deflected in some fashion, so its momentum is altered. Mm -hmm. And the more you can find it, the more its pilot wave is distorted. And so you basically have a position uh, momentum on yeah, certain introduced by intrinsically by the pilot wave. Okay, so that's my uh, comment on uncertainty relations. My comment on entanglement, which I didn't have time to do because I was running over, is as follows. So again, this suggests a physical mechanism for understanding entanglement. Okay, so while they would say spin is an int intrinsic feature of a quantum particle, we, saying, we are saying that it's a manifestation of 
uh, angular motion on the Compton scale. So you literally have things, this internal clock in the electron, for example, would correspond to a, uh, an object, a charge zipping around the Compton uh, wavelength at the Compton frequency. Okay, so now if you bring two such clocks together, you bring mm -hmm. two particles together, the, you can see, imagine that their internal clocks become synchronized. And then when these particles are separated, they have, in, they have synchronized internal clocks, and this then can lead to correlations that you wouldn't otherwise anticipate. So the point is, the yeah, question is cool. whether by resolving this dynamics on the Compton scale, you can account for these anomalous uh, correlations. So that's the sort of physical picture which I'm pursuing now with uh, Konstantinos Papatrifonos and, and uh, Mathieu Labouste in Paris. Mm -hmm. So in these uh, hydrodynamic quantum analogs, really we've been thinking that the, so for example, the Landau orbits and so forth, the De Bruyne wavelength, the Faraday wavelength is playing the role of the De Bruyne wavelength, okay? So this is, that's the general understanding. But we also have this, again, this possibility of these spin states in hydrodynamics, and we would like for those to be on the Compton scale, okay? What we see with this hydrodynamic quantum field theory, there's actually manifestation uh, of both wavelengths on the pilot wave. So you can expect to get structure on the Compton scale. So the, the pilot wave in the relativistic limit, the dominant wavelength is the Compton scale. So then these hydrodynamic spin states would be modeling dynamics on the Compton scale in quantum mechanics. But in the non-relativistic, so the, the, in general, one can also think of the statistics emerging on the De Bruyne wavelength in the non-relativistic limit. Is that clear? And so there's a, a large difference between the, the sizes there, and that's making up for a lot of the differences between the dual slit experiments that uh, um, were reportedly falsified, and then you found actually, well, it's because of these differences in the, the size between the slits, et cetera. And so it's the difference between those, the sizes of those wavelengths that is uh, making the difference between you know, the, this analog and an actual you know, electrodynamics. And, yeah, and also the fact that the pilot waveform, I expect to be very different in quantum mechanics. I mean, if it looks like something in our HQFT, then I suspect, and this is, of course, we're trying this now, then I suspect that we can get a Fraunhofer diffraction. Good question. So, so the idea is that the a particle has a given mass and associated with that mass is a frequency. So this is a sort of de la Peñanchetto, this is their sort of view of uh, in stochastic electrodynamics. And in fact, it was Dupuy's initial proposal. So the particle has an associated frequency and the vacuum has some bro very broad frequency uh, spectrum. And, but it, as long as it has some energy in the frequency of the particle, there will be some interaction. And, and the idea is that that will then excite the vibration of this particle at its Compton frequency. Okay. And, and so, so in terms of HQFT, what we've done is it said, okay, the particle has, is this is oscillating at its natural frequency, exciting a wave. You can add a, you can add an additional degree of freedom. And uh, Carlos Gomez, who I'm working with now, is doing precisely this, saying, okay, let's treat the particle as an oscillator with a natural frequency, and it's and and he can actually you can then model the excitation of that particle by the background field, provided there's some uh, again energy in, in the appropriate frequency. Okay, so then experimentally, if instead of using a uh, discrete frequency for forcing, you had a forcing that had a spectrum of frequencies in it, do you still see the same phenomenology? Uh, so you, uh, so people have done, so Tristan Gillet and a group in um, uh, Simula in, in um, Australia, they've been looking at uh, forcing with a couple of frequencies, and you do have to get resonance. I mean, the resonance is key. If you force it with white noise, uh, I mean, experimentally, it, it's not gonna work. They've run with sort of two commensurate frequencies, and you can, again, achieve resonance, but resonance is the key, because re without resonance, you don't get the monochromatic wave field, and it's the monochromatic wave field which imposes the quantization on the system. So it's simply the fact that there is, if there is a background field, um, so, you know, whether it's an electromagnetic quantum vacuum, whether it's the Higgs field, uh, provided that that doesn't, so if, if there's no dissipation, the memory is basically infinite, right? So the particle then carves out its topography and moves in response to it, but you do need a background field. Okay, so the, so the, the, memory history, that, yeah. the, the history function essentially extends over the entire lifetime yeah. of the universe. That's right. Yeah, we're basically saying you have to say 
And we're basically, in HQFT, we're looking at the limit of no wave damping. So basically, we're in the infinite memory limit of the hydrodynamic case. But it, it, it is clear from the hydrodynamic case that, you know, wave, viscous wave damping is your enemy. So you want to move, uh, uh, get, get rid of that as soon as possible. And of course, you have to worry about energetics. But here, the, in HQFT, the energy is radiated away from the particle. Okay, thanks. Okay.